Welcome to Time Travel Reads. This is my January 24, 2024 wrap up. Most of you probably already know about my American history project. For those of you who don't know, I am reading from the colonial period to the present. I started the project this month, so I'm in the colonial period. The first book I read was Abigail Adams by Woody Holton. I mostly read this for fun, but it will fit into the revolutionary part of the project. I return to the Adamses whenever I want a fun topic. For some reason, they've intrigued me since I was a teenager. This particular book emphasized the financial aspect of Abigail's life. She was good with finances, business, and investing. She was the reason why John, unlike so many founders, died with money instead of dying in debt. She also made a will, which wasn't legal at the time. Married women were appendages to their husbands, not separate entities. They couldn't legally have recognized wills, yet her husband and son followed her will to the letter instead of throwing it into the fire, which was equally unusual. She left money almost exclusively to women, trying to give them the not quite legal right to personal property. The second book I read was A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived by Adam Rutherford. This was my historathon book for January. Rutherford discusses Neanderthal DNA, early modern humans, the mixing they sometimes did, and the ethics of DNA research. The third book isn't really a book, but I still count it because it was 24 hours long and it will help with my project. I listened to The Civil War Great Course by Gary Gallagher. When I get to the Civil War books, having that overview will help me have some context. The fourth book was Hot Protestants by Michael Winship. That book was an academic book, so it probably wasn't calculated to make me despise the Puritans, but it did. <laughs> they were so fanatical and so theocratic, they drove me crazy. Still, I definitely recommend the book. Here are some of the notes I wrote. The early English Puritans loved calling anyone they didn't like all sorts of names like Wild Beasts and Esau Four. Don't ask me to explain that one. They also enjoyed such wholesome pastimes as torture and beheading. No wonder they eventually killed so many so-called witches. The standard American history myth says that the Puritans came here as poor persecuted people seeking religious freedom. Actually, they were proud of their refusal to get along with anyone, including each other, at any time, for any reason. This won them enemies. They tried to set up holier-than-thou communities in America so they could influence the early the Church of England back home. They wanted to basically take over the Anglican Church so they could have an enormous amount of control over England. I wish the book had explained better just how they threatened the power of the reigning clergy and the monarch, like the, the mechanics of how that worked, but they definitely felt threatened. Laws were stricter and more based in bib biblical law in New England than in England itself. More crimes were capital crimes than in England. Adultery was a capital crime. Whipping was the most usual punishment for crimes. Ministers were not consulted by the Plymouth government. Now, Plymouth was a little different than Boston because they were separatists, not regular Puritans because they had separated from the Church of England and they didn't want to create another system of ministers having secular offices. New England Puritans were fine with slavery because it was in the Bible and it made them money. Puritans defined their liberty as the ability to hold society to God's narrow path, not to allow for tolerance or liberty of conscience. And I had access to this book in audio formats because for some reason my library has, well, I have access to two libraries uh, um, and one of them has a lot of academic books as audio in, in the audio format. And I think this one is meant to be read with eyeballs and 
I wish that this book had been given, had given definitions, explanations of concepts and people and reminders of key information for non-specialists. It expects you to have background, background information which you may not have and which I certainly didn't have going in. So those are my notes for that book. And then while I read Hot Protestants, which I had to focus on, I could not read that one. I could not listen to that one in the car. I just had to listen to that one while doing nothing else. <laughs> I could not have distractions for that one. So if you try to listen to that as an audiobook, just know that going in. While I read Hot Protestants, I listened to Revolution Song by Russell Shorto whenever I was in the car. It told the story of the Seven Years' War and Revolution in Several Lives. Shorto was a very good storyteller. He made sure to give you all the context you needed to know about who was who and why everything was important. I wish I'd read The Island at the Center of the World by the same author instead, just to read in order, but I forgot. The sixth book I read was The Devil in the Shape of a Woman by Carol F. Carlson. It was a fascinating look at the demographics of who was most likely to be accused and convicted of witchcraft during the New England witchcraft outbreaks. Basically, a woman over 40 who inherited property in her own right was most likely to be convicted, especially if she was considered to have an outspoken personality or if a man in her family or community could financially benefit from her death. The women most likely to be possessed by devils were young women and girls whose parents were killed in King Philip's war. Their inheritances and therefore their dowries had been destroyed in the war and they were living as servants. Possession was the experience of the devil offering the woman a husband, fine clothes, and other material advantages they were unlikely to ever receive in exchange for signing the devil's contract. The book didn't explain what exactly the contract entailed. Perhaps this isn't known. If a man was accused of being a witch, he was likely the family member of a convicted witch, a convicted woman witch, he was also likely treated more leniently. Sometimes he was accused of being a liar for saying that, for admitting that he was a witch. I think the book was written in the 80s, but it's still a very good introduction to the topic. The seventh book was The United States of English by Rosemary Osler. It was about the development of American English. The book has three major problems, unfortunately. One is a personal preference that may not be fair, and the other two, I think, are fair. The first is that I wanted a book that would describe to me how to communicate with someone from a different time period. <laughs> that may be a little bit odd. Um, there, but there are books on daily life and other times, and I wanted a book on daily speech and other times. This book didn't give me a good sense of what people in each time and place described would have said and how they would have said it. Instead, this feels more like a trivia book. Perhaps my expectations were too high or just different than the author's intentions. The second problem that I have with the book is that it needed reorganization. It didn't stick to a time period and place before moving on. Instead, it skipped between centuries, regions, and topics without warning, sometimes circling back to an original point after going on a tangent. I don't like when books do that. It's hard to follow, and it makes it difficult to retain information from very detailed books like this. I think the author needed to cover each topic for each region within a single time period before moving on to the next time period. This method would have produced a plotting but more understandable narrative. My third problem is that it, the title feels a little dishonest. The title would have been more honest if it had claimed to be a book about the coasts instead of about the whole United States. 
it mainly covered the East Coast, and when it got away from there, it jumped across the country to California. It mostly ex ignored the rest of the country in between the two coasts, and in fact spent more time on other English-speaking nations than on flyover country. It mentioned Chicago briefly, it mentioned westward expansion, but failed to go into detail on how that affected speech in the West beyond explaining Chicano English in the California section. And it had a few paragraphs on Californians spreading their influence to Oregon and Colorado, which I haven't personally noticed living in Colorado my entire life. And that was about the extent of the author's interest in flyover country. I'm disappointed, but I shouldn't be too surprised. Overall, I can't call this book worth the time investment I put into it. Mm -hmm. The last book was Mayflower by Nathaniel Philbrick. It doesn't go into the detail that Hot Protestants does into how the Puritan related denominations developed. It does go into practical details of how the pilgrims separatist pilgrims and strangers not to be confused with a puritan group who came a little later came to america in a way that hot protestants doesn't hot protestants is a political and religious history mayflower is a popular narrative history i'm tempted to say that you should read hot protestants then the devil in the shape of a woman then mayflower I'm not sure what to say about the Pilgrim's relationship to the Indians. It was peaceful for about 50 years. They, went, they eventually wanted more land, which put a lot of pressure on the tribes that had once traditionally helped them. At first, they treated the tribes individually so that if one tribe was hostile and another one was friendly, the Pilgrims reacted accordingly, but they began to view all Indians in an increasingly racialized way with some taking the view that the only good Indian was a dead Indian, which meant that the tribes who wanted peace were forced to fight the English. The English committed genocide. That is clear and terrible. The last thing I wanted to mention is the book I just started. They Knew They Were Pilgrims by John G. Turner is about how the separatists, aka pilgrims, understood the concept of religious liberty. It covers much of the same, it seems to cover the same ground as Mayflower, but in a more academic way. I think I'll end up recommending that people read another book that I haven't started yet, then Hot Protestants, then The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, then either They Knew They Were Pilgrims or Mayflower, depending on whether someone is looking for a longer academic book or a shorter popular history book. I'm trying to develop a preferred order in which to recommend that people read these colonial books. Okay, that was a lot for me since my videos are normally short. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>